So if you guys have your Bibles, pull those out, hopefully paper, paper copies. We encourage you guys to bring your Bibles because we want you to follow as we're reading God's Word, to be follow what we're reading in God's Word because we're all responsible to make sure everything that we hear, it's filtered through God's Word, right? We have to have um, the perspective of everything that we do in life, um, the information that we hear, if it's against God's word, we have to be able to filter it out. And we can only filter those things out if we know God's word, if we're following it. So I encourage you guys, as we're going to be going through scripture today, writing them down, going home and going through them. And I first want to start off with a story. So I don't know how many of you guys were given this task, but as a kid, um, we lived on a property And my parents would assign us different chores. And one of them that I always got stuck with was pulling weeds. And we had quite a bit of property and we had quite a bit of weeds. And we were given this task. You got to pull these weeds. This is your territory. And most of the time I would be pulling weeds with my mom. So she would have a section and I would have a section that I'm pulling weeds. And it was about the same size. And every time that we were pulling weeds, I would always be the first one to complete it, every time. And I would go through pulling the weeds very quickly. I would have all this equipment. She gave us these different tools that helps you kind of dig out the weeds because we had a lot of really deep weeds. And I did not enjoy it. I just, when it was hot, I just wanted to get it done. And I knew once I got it done, there was always a reward after. Whether um, I could go play, whether I get to eat some ice cream, or there was something where I, I got to be done. That was really the reward. And I would get it done as quickly as possible. And three weeks later, we noticed why I got it done so quickly is because you could see the two territories that my mom pulled the weeds and where I pulled the weeds, and the weeds were already back. And I look on where my mom was pulling the weeds, and the ground still looks really good. And my mom would bring it up to me, you sure pulled the weeds, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, and I did it so quickly. And here, I had to redo the work. So I had to do twice the work, because originally, I pulled the weeds, but I pulled them from the top surface. So what I would do, you guys would probably, you guys can probably guess, is I would grab the weed on the top and I would get as close as I can to the ground and just spin it off. So the root was still in the ground, but the top surface was gone completely. So I was able to contain the land for a couple weeks. It contained itself, right? But then after a couple weeks, it exposed everything, the work, the work that I did, right? And This is something that we see a lot happening in the world today. Um, A lot of people are trying to contain their life. They're trying to manage it. They're trying to um, temporarily, they have these solutions that are, these solutions that are temporarily, right? They're trying to uh, suppress their depression. They're trying to um, be happy. They're trying to hold things together. They're trying to um, maintain their health whether it's eating healthy food, whether it's um, exercising. They're trying to maintain these things, but they don't, they're not long, long term. They only last for so long. And we see that nowadays very much. We see, we see that the suicide rates are very high, more than they've ever been. We see that the overdose is more than we've ever seen. We see that the problem with alcohol, it's more than we've ever seen. We see kids suffering. Um, they're not able to retain information. We see all these different problems. And I, and I see this in the place that I work. When a problem comes up, instead of removing the issue, instead of fixing what the problem is, people suppress it. They try to hold it together for a time, and they try to keep it together for just um, until they figure out what to do. And we see that over and over. And the word that I really want to talk about today is to stop containing. In our life, we are to stop containing things, and we are to have dominion over things. Just like the testimonies we shared, right? Dominion over the mosquitoes, right? Why were they attracted to him? Is because he's light. 
Mosquitoes are attracted to light. We are light, but we have dominion over things. We have dominion over the things of this world that bring us down, right? We don't have dominion over people. We have to remember that. We don't have dominion over people, but we have dominion over the demonic force. We have dominion over health, right? We are to be healthy. That is God's promise to us. And we, um, with our thoughts even, we can't just contain our thoughts. We can't just hold them. We can't just restrain them. We can't just try to control them. We have to line them up to God's word and having dominion in those things. And just like I was pulling the weeds, right? I pull them from the top surface. And in our life, if we try to contain things and only pull them from the top surface, they're going to come back and they're going to keep growing. And until that root, until that root of whether it's a problem or whatever it is, a lifestyle is completely removed out, it's going to come back and it may come back and even control us even more. And with the weeds, I had to redo the work. I pulled the weeds and a couple weeks later, I had to redo it again. And believe it or not, when I redid it, I was so upset, I did the same thing. The same thing, and I had to redo it again. And by three times that I redid it, the property in the area that my mom pulled the weeds, her, it looked perfect there because she went from the ground. She went deep into the root. She removed it. It took her maybe longer. It took her more work from the beginning, but it was long term. But I was just trying to solve a problem so that I can just get it done and go past it. And many people have that issue with their thoughts. So they get a thought from the enemy and they just, yep, that's not true. No, that's not true. And they don't actually capture that thought. They don't line that thought to God's word and say, no, you know, if the enemy tries to bring a symptom of sickness, they say, no, I'm healthy. No, I'm healthy. And they just keep going, but they don't aggressively go at it. No, I am healed by his stripes. It is written, enemy, you back off. And if the enemy tries to come again, you do the same thing. You have to be very, very diligent in that, and you have to go aggressively. And we can see these, this um, same tactic in sports teams. So I grew up playing sports, and one thing that I saw was um, there's always two sides, right? There's a defense and there's an offense, just like in the kingdom, right? There's God's kingdom and there's the enemy's kingdom, and they're going against each other. And just like in sports, there's an offensive team and a defensive team, depending on who has the ball. And when the off offensive team has the ball, a lot of the time what I noticed as an athlete is a defender would come up and they would try to contain when I have the ball. So what they're doing is, as an offensive player, when I have the ball, they're just containing me and just trying to keep me in the position I'm at. They're trying to just make sure that I'm standing where I'm at. They're trying to move around, move around. And over a time, they get exhausted. And all I have to do is just quickly get around them. Because what they were trying to do is just keep me in the position. They were just trying to contain instead of aggressively go and take the ball from me. I was a soccer player. So they would just stand around, stand around. And they're, they're doing a lot of work. It looks like it but they're not going aggressively. The purpose is to take the ball away. But when you're just running around the ball and you're just trying to contain the player there, you're not gonna go anywhere. You're gonna get physically exhausted. And that's what we're gonna go into is, we are not to contain our lives. We're not trying to contain things. We're trying to have dominion. We should have dominion over things. And we can see that in the Bible, we were given this dominion. We were given dominion in the beginning. So if we go into Genesis 1, and this is a Bible verse that we go over and over because our church is called Dominion Life. And if we go to Genesis 1.28, we can read what it says there. Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on this earth. It doesn't say contain the fish, right? It says to have dominion. What dominion means is taking charge of, you being in charge of it, you being above the problem, you being above the things that are trying to pull at you. 
right? We're not trying, and you're going to hear this word a lot, containing, contain. We're not Christians who contain things. We're, pe- we're believers who have dominion over things, who when there's fire around us, we walk right through it, right? We're not trying to contain a fire. We walk through the fire and it does not touch us. That's what dominion is. And God did not call us to contain things. He called us to have dominion over things. And there's a very big difference between containing and having dominion. Right now, the earth, the world is trying to contain some kind of virus. And they're containing it, containing it, containing it. But what if there wasn't no virus, right? Having dominion as a believer is what that means for us. No sickness can touch us, right? No disease can touch us. That's dominion. But what containing is, is when someone has something and they're just trying to hold it. They're trying it um, not to let them affect the rest of their life. And we're going to continue reading in Luke. So if you guys can flip over to Luke 10. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing, absolutely nothing, shall by any means hurt you. We've been given this authority. So in the beginning when God created the earth, he gave dominion to us, right? He said, hey, this earth is yours, it's yours, right? Everything that's happening in the world is happening because of decisions that people have made. And God's not controlling everything that's happening in the world, right? We know that. The things that are happening in the world is up to people because the earth was given to us. And we are here taking care of the earth. And God tells us that we, he gives us this authority. And the boldness that we have is that we have his authority. Everything that he has And where we go, nothing, no power, nothing around us, no sickness, no disease, no fear, no nothing by any means will hurt us. And that's the boldness that we have to be able to walk through things. We're able to walk through whatever is happening around us because we have this. And we always have to go back to this because many people who are in fear, they forget what authority they have. They forget who they are in. But when we understand that we are in Christ, that we have what he has, and that what does the Bible say? That he never leaves us. He will never leave us. The enemy will try to send us a lie that, oh, you know, he'll try to bring us fear. He'll try to convince us that we're alone. But we're not alone. God is always with us. He never leaves us. And that's important for us to understand because before something comes at us, if we know who we are in Christ, If we know that when we walk through anything, it will not affect us. When a problem comes, when something tries to come our way, when the enemy tries to bring us a lie, we're going to be able to walk through it. But in the middle of a problem, when we're trying to figure out who we are, it's really hard. Because what happens is you start to panic. You start to worry. You're trying to remember who are you. You're trying to remember who your name is. Your name is in Christ. Your name is victorious. Your name is righteousness. That's who we are. So we have to constantly be dwelling on that. And when we're dwelling on that, anything that comes our way, we can easily boot it out because it's who we are. It's our identity, right? But when we are not grounded, when we're, we're not rooted in our identity, and what does rooted mean? Rooted means constantly growing, constantly meditating in. Roots that survive are roots that grow. Roots that do not grow and continue to grow, they end up rotting. They don't end up growing. They begin um, to harden. The soil around it begins to harden, right? So being rooted in Christ means constantly growing. It means constantly being in his word. And it's not work. This is what we have to remember. It's not works that we're doing. It's relationships. It's not a job, it's not work for me to be with my husband. It's not work for me to try to have a relationship. No, that's what it is. A relationship is a natural thing. It's something that we grow towards. It's something that when we spend time together, it's enjoyable, right? We have relationships with people that we enjoy to spend time with, that we enjoy being around with. I hope you guys do, 
You know, there might be people in our lives that um, aren't as pleasing to be around, but that's okay, right? They need us. They need us to be around them. They need help. And we can do that. We can provide that for them. But being with Christ, having that relationship with him, being rooted in him, knowing his word, it's not work. When we have that relationship with him, what it does is it continues to reveal to us who we are in him. When we have that relationship with him, he continues to reveal how much he loves us. He continues to show us who he is, and we're able to take that and display it to others. We're able to, um, those are our roots. God's word is what we need to be rooted in. And we see that in Genesis, we were given that dominion. We see in Luke that we can walk through anything and nothing will hurt us. Anything, no matter what's happening in the world, we can walk right through it. And we're going to go into another verse. So Colossians. Colossians 2. So this one's a bit of a longer scripture. So Colossians 5, and we're going to read through 10. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught. So I'm going to stop right there. So in verse 5 we see, I am with you in spirit, right? Even though physically he's not in flesh, right? But in spirit, and that's inside of us. Right? So wherever we take a step, if I take a step to the right, he's with me. If I take a step to the left, he's with me. Very practical, right? Not complicated. So when the enemy sends you a lie that you're alone, that you can't do this, uh, or fear, you know, you get a feeling of fear, wherever you go, God's with you. So can you be in fear? Can you be in any lack? Absolutely not. Because he is with you in spirit. He is in you, inside of you, and he will never leave you. And we see that we received Christ through what? Through faith, right? So we don't have to do something for him to leave us or for him to come into us, right? It's by faith. By faith, we received him. So by faith, we walk it out. By faith, when the enemy tries to send us that you're alone, no. The truth is he is with me. That is our faith. That is what we stand on. And we don't waver on that. And the enemy, he will try to bombard us with thoughts. But the Bible says, right, if we resist, what does he do? He flee. He has to flee. So when we resist once and he comes again, what do we do? We resist again. If he tries to send another thought, what do we do? We resist. It doesn't say resist once and he'll flee, right? It doesn't just say, but if he tries to come again and again, we do the same thing that God's word says. We continually stand on it. We resist and we resist. And we keep resisting. And when he sees that it's not affecting you, when, he's, when he knows that he can't touch you, he's gonna, he has to flee. Because that's, that's what God's word says, is that when we resist, he flees. So remember, when you get a thought, when something comes your way, when you're talking to someone and they're, they don't know what to do, they're bombarded with thoughts, simplicity. Going back to what God's word, it says resist. And when people don't resist, that's when the enemy wipes them out. When people try to contain, when people try to be passive. Not, most people don't try to be passive, they just are passive. There's a difference. You don't try to be passive, people just tend to be passive. They tend to just let their thoughts be bombarded. They just let the enemy tell them whatever they want. And when you do that, the enemy tr begins to wipe people out like that, right? But... When we are resisting, we're, when we're continuing to do that, what we're doing is we're building who we are. We're, okay, the enemy sends you a thought that, um, for instance, I'll share an example. So this week at work, we had uh, four people out 
that I had to cover for. So I, do, I was covering for four people, including my boss, and I was also training a new hire. So we had a new person start. So I was, I, my workload was times four plus training someone. And I, you know, as the week was started, I could just see my emails just boom, boom, boom. Just, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this? I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, I'm gonna do this. And um, the interesting thing was, is I was looking at all the work that I had and I was not worried, I wasn't concerned until the person that I was training brought it up to me and said, how are you gonna get all this done? How are you gonna be able to do all this? And it's interesting how the enemy will even use other people to bring things up. And as soon as she said that, that's when my thoughts started going, oh yeah, how am I, how am I gonna do all this? And I had to stop and be like, no, no, that's not true. I can do all things. And I turned to her and said, you know what? You're gonna help me with this. I'm gonna train you. You're gonna help me also. And we're gonna get everything that we need to get done, done. And she, she said something, she's like, wow, that's like a superpower. I'm like, no, that's just us being able to get stuff done. We're gonna, whatever came through, we're gonna get done because we have to get it done. And it's interesting how even in our, our thoughts, we may not, um, you know, that thought didn't come into me until someone else brought it up. And that's why we have to be on, on guard because thoughts can come through different avenues. They can come from different people. They can come from our own thoughts, right? They can um, come from maybe even things that we see. Sometimes when you're driving, you see a sign or you see something, or when you're uh, scrolling through the internet or something and you see something and it triggers a thought. So we have to be very um, aware that thoughts can come from different avenues and we have to be on guard. We can't be passive. We can't just let thoughts go through. And a lot of people do this when they're watching TV. They're watching TV and then they wonder why they're so upset or why they're so irritated. And they're trying to figure out what happened. And what happened was there was all these commercials about sickness. There was all these commercials about if you're feeling depressed, just these commercials going on and on. And people tend to turn off when they're watching TV, but your brain is still there, right? You're still consuming information. So it's very important for us not to just consume information, but to be on guard, to use God's word as our filter. This is what we look at the world through, is God's eyes, God's word. Just like this, right? I'm not looking at it from my own perspective, but I have to be looking at it through God's perspective. So we're going to continue reading. Rooted and built, it, built up in him and established in the faith. So we're rooted and built up in him. He, he is what roots us. His truth is what roots us. In order to be rooted, we have to know his truth. We can't just try to get rooted through our own ability, through our own works. It doesn't work like that. Being rooted is in him and through him. Be aware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So be aware. We are to be aware, and that's not being passive. We cannot be passive. We always have to be on guard. For instance, um, I was walking this morning. Um, I went to the grocery store early in the morning, and I was walking um, through our like apartment complex, and I'm someone that... Um, if someone, I mean, a natural thing, if someone jumps at you, what do you do? You get ready, you kind of like tense up. And as an athlete, I was always used to that. When someone's coming at me, I tense up, I get ready to attack. So I was walking um, down the stairs and someone was hitting the corner really, really quick. And I had grocery bags. And um, <laughs> as they were walking very quickly, and they were quiet, so I couldn't hear them. But I naturally, as they popped up, I was like this. I was on guard, and they, they got really scared. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I did, you know. But that's how we are supposed to be as believers. And I'm not saying we're supposed to be aggressive and always wanting to punch someone. That's not what I'm saying. But yes, with the enemy, you are to always be on guard, and you have to be ready to have your fist up and be like, nope, God's word says this. And you're not fighting him. The fight is already won. You're just making sure to put it right back where it's supposed to go. Be like, no, this is the truth. It is written. This is what it says. This is what you're going to obey. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to fight him. If you're trying to fight the enemy, 
you're doing it wrong. The fight is already over. We are to just show him the trophy again. Hey, this is what, this is the truth, and God's word is true, and he won, and you're done. You know, we're supposed to do that. Because a lot of people are trying to wrestle the enemy. They're trying to fight him. And when you're doing that, you're not doing that through God's word. When you're doing that, you're doing it out of your own ability. When you're trying to fight the enemy, you're doing it in your own ability. And you will not defeat the enemy in your own ability because the fight is already over. Jesus already won. He already won it all, and he won it for us so that we can have that access, so that what he did is our victory too. The fact that he defeated the enemy, that's our victory. We share that victory. You know how um, when you win a trophy or you win a gold medal, you do a lap uh, with your flag, like in the Olympics? Usually when a track runner, they run the 100 mile, they get their flag and they run, they do a victory lap. Well, we're still doing that victory lap and it does not end. We're continuing to do that victory lap. And as we're doing that victory lap, we're taking people with us. We're showing them, hey, Victory is already won, join the team, join the victory, join the great benefit of what Jesus did for us. So we have to be aware of those things. And it, it, it's interesting how it says um, in eight, verse 8, according to the basic principles of the world. So the world creates these basic principles. If you do this, then this will happen, right? There's a lot, there's a cause and effect to everything that the world does. Right? If you, um, I'm trying to think of an example. If you smoke, your lungs are going to what? Yeah, and that's pretty factual, right? If you do this, then this will happen. But the world puts a lot of principles in play um, that are not, don't apply to us, right? Or even, um, so traditions of man or culture things. So I, this is a big one that I hear. I grew up in the Slavic culture, and some of you may have heard this from our grandparents, but you have to wear um, a hat when your hair is wet, or you'll get sick, right? And I remember growing up, and I'm like, okay. And as we started to get into this message, I heard people say that, and they say, you need to wear a hat if you're wear, your hair is wet because you're going to get sick. And I started to correct them. No, you need to wear a hat because your head's going to get cold. The, the, the cause and the effect is not that you're going to get sick, but that's how people believe. Another one is you need to wear a coat because if you go outside, you'll get sick. Why are you prophesying that over your kids? No, if you don't wear a coat, you're going to be cold. And I started to say that to my grandparents and just, you know, and they're like, well, no, you will get sick. Well, if that's what you believe, yeah, you will, you will get sick. And a lot of people, that's what's been instilled into them. You have to wear a coat or what's going to happen? I'm going to get sick. And even kids say that. And I see that. And um, some of my cousins say that. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not going to get sick. You're going to get cold. Put your jacket on. It's cold outside, right? But there's a lot of um, these cause and effects and these principles that the world puts in. And the Bible tells us to be aware of those things because it's very innocent. If you don't wear your coat, you'll get sick. It gets snuck in very easily. But if we're not on guard and we say, oh, yeah, I need to put my coat on because I'm going to get sick, you start believing those things and you don't even realize it. And as a kid, I believe that because my grandma always told me that. She always told me, you have to wear socks inside because the tile floor is cold and you're going to get sick. And that was just a constant thing. And there's this, um, so in the Russian culture, one thing that's also, I, I, and I, I still get it, whenever I go to anyone's house, you have to put slippers on. And they're called tapochki in Russian. You have to put slippers on or you're going to get sick because your feet are going to get cold. And it's when you walk into um, a Slavic grandma's house, that's the first thing. You have to put slippers on. Oh, here, here. And I mean, it's like the first thing you have to do before you get past the door, right? And it's instilled in them that if they don't wear the slippers, they're going to get sick. And the interesting thing is, if they get sick, they blame it. It's because I didn't wear slippers. It's not the slippers' fault you're sick. The enemy is the one who, whose fault it is always. He's the one, the source of sickness. God isn't. 
In him is only goodness. In him is only health. In him is only joy. All sickness is of the enemy. But people will say, oh, it's because of the slippers. It's because you didn't wear your jacket. It's because you didn't eat healthy. It's because you didn't do this. And those things, you're giving, give credit to who it belongs. Or they'll even say, God's teaching me something. God's, you know, God put cancer on me so that it will draw me near to him. That is a lie of the enemy. Sickness this goal is to kill you. It's not to draw you to God. A lot of people, they're drawn to God when they have issues. But the truth is, sickness will kill you. If you it, it's a babe, right? It, it will grow to death. That's what the goal of sickness. And give credit to who sickness belongs to, the enemy. All sickness is of the enemy, and it does not belong to us. And people are going to say, you're way too aggressive. That's not true. They're going to hate that. Religious people hate that because they have had bad experiences and they let their experiences dictate truth and they're trying to just coddle, coddle the problem. They're just trying to say, it's okay, it's okay. And that's what the Bible continues to talk about. Don't let the principles of the world, don't let them um, trick you. Don't let them try to convince you otherwise. Never let the world try to convince you against the truth. And if someone is trying to... Um, convince you or trying to persuade you, you tell them, no, it is written. This is what God's word says. And don't, you know, if the people want to argue and if people want to live their lifestyle of believing the lie of the enemy, our job is to help them. Our job is to show them truth. But if they don't want to accept that truth, it's not our responsibility, right? It's not our responsibility to con convince them every single day and try to bug them. Don't put a burden on yourself to try to change religious people. We are to help them, right? We are trying to encourage them. We are trying to show them God's word. And you can continue to plant the seed, but don't waste your energy in arguing. Arguing will not get anywhere. With your lifestyle, with your testimony, show them the truth. Show them who God is through your life. That is the biggest testimony because it is a lot easier for someone to see that your life has changed and they are going to start questioning things. They're going to start questioning what they believe. How many people, just a raise of hands, have shared a testimony and it has brought attention to another person? Your personal testimony. How many people have shared their testimony and it has brought attention to someone? Right? A testimony, what is it? It's saying, hey, this is what God did in my life. Because they can go in God's word and find, read the Bible they hear scriptures all the time. They see them on the Instagram feed, a scripture. But when you tell them, God did this in my life. My life was like this, and he did this. And they see, okay, it's not just words on paper. But a lot of people, they don't see actions. They don't see testimonies. They don't see believers doing something. So they're like, well, yeah, I know God's word is true, but why isn't it working in people's life? in their life, but they also don't see it in other people's life. And that's the power of testimonies. That's why we share testimonies, because we're showing and we're giving credit to who it belongs, to God. We're giving the glory to God. That's the power of testimonies. And when people try to convince us, when people try to convince us into the ideas and principles of the world, we tell them, no, that's not true, because this is what God did, and that lines up to his word, so this is true. And a testimony will never not be lined up to God's word. If somebody has a testimony that, yeah, I had cancer and then I went to chemo and God healed me. We're not saying doctors aren't bad. We're, we're, say, we're not saying they're bad. We're not saying that. But God's power, God's truth, he will not bring sickness upon you in order to bring you to him. That is not truth. That is what the enemy wants you to believe. So then what can he do? Kill you. That's what he wants to do. Same with any problem that comes up in life. God doesn't put problems in our life so that we can be drawn to him. That's like me um, throwing my husband down the stairs so that I can run up to him and put a Band-Aid on his hand. That's so silly, right? It sounds completely silly, but that's exactly what believers are thinking, that God pushes us into a sickness, God puts a sickness on us so then he can be the healer and then he can get the glory. That's just absolutely ridiculous. But believe it or not, the church believes that. 
because their experience doesn't line up to God's word, so they're letting their bad experience be truth. And truth doesn't change. Facts change, but God's word will never change, and who he is will never change either. So we're going to continue reading. For in him dwells all the fullness of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Who are we complete in? Him. We are complete in him, who is the head of all the principalities and powers. So we are in him. Remember, we read, right? We have dominion. We have authority. We have ability to walk through anything and it not harm us. And we, are, we have his fullness completely in him. So when someone says, who do you think you are? Jesus is the answer. And you can prove it through scripture and scripture. That is your identity. You're in him. You're not doing it on your own, but you're in him. You're as he is. And a lot of people won't like that. Who do you think you are? Jesus? Actually, according to God's word, I have his fullness and he is in me and I work with him and we're one. So you're kind of right. You are right. Right? So people don't like that because you're being bold. We have a lot of weak people in this world. Weak as in we can even see that the media is trying to make people, in specifically men, they are trying to make them look weak. They're tr- the masculinity of men, they're trying to put down, right? They're trying to make, um, as believers, as these are weak people, believers, men, fathers of a household, they're trying to put them down, and that's through these different um, women's rights that they're trying to put through, all these women parades, all these different things. And I know people don't like to hear that, but God created us in his fullness in him, and we are strong in him. Men or women, there's not one better than him because we are all in his fullness. We're in his fullness. And society is trying to bring families down. That's what the, you, we have to understand. That's what the enemy is trying to do. He's, ty- he's trying to target men specifically within families, trying to tear them down, telling them they're not good enough, telling them that they're weak so that families can be broken. That is a tactic of the enemy, and we have to be on guard. As men, as women, as people in the household, right, we have to stand firm and say, no, this is my family. I'm standing firm. I'm going to stand for what God's word says, that no one can take this away, that I am strong in Christ, that I can do all things, that I have this ability, because God created us strong. God created us in his image, and whatever he creates in his image is beautiful, it's great, it's bold. He did not create anything that's um, useless. Everything that he created has value and has worth in him. And we have to remember that. And no society, no, no one can tell us that. Media can't tell us that. Society can't tell us that. Nobody can because we believe what God's word says and his word is above anything. So we have to go back to that. So we're going to continue And some of these scriptures have just, not some, but all of them have so much in them. We can continue just dig, dig, and dig. And something that I want to talk about is um, fires. So fires get contained, right? And if you live around here, um, you know fires. You know wildfires. You know what it does to um, ground, what it does to people's homes. Um, And there's different, um, in the Bible, fires are mentioned many different times, uh, talking about different things. Not always the same fire, right? Not always the fire of God. So we understand that the source, so the fire of God, he is the source of light, and we are light, right? So he is the all-consuming fire. He is light, that's what he is, and we are light. So when anything tries to penetrate through us, or when anything tries to come our way, we're able to walk right through it, and we're supposed to be burning things that do not belong in this world, right? We're supposed to be killing sickness and disease. We're supposed to be saying, no, you be gone. We're supposed to just walk through those things. But there's also, uh, the fire that I'm talking about is a physical fire, so wildfires. So fires tend to symbolize, um, just in general, through history and through different things, it tends to, um, 
and, and throughout the Bible, some of the things that it tends to um, symbolize is passion, desire, rebirth, uh, eternity, destruction, hell, also hope, purification, uh, specifically when gold or different metals are burned and cleaned. And so there's fires, it symbolizes a lot of different things. And we're specifically going to talk about physical fires that are being contained. So a little bit about fires. So I'm sure a lot of you guys know, but um, wildfires can be very dangerous. Well, not can be, they are very dangerous because they destroy um, land, they destroy homes. And firefighters are experienced and trained, um, mostly trained in um, containing wildfires and experience, why I don't say they're always experienced, um, is the fact that wildfires aren't something that, they don't happen often, but in order to be experienced in them, you have to you know, be around the wildfire. So many of them are trained, and they, they do training through different techniques. And when a wildfire, so firefighters know the risk that they're putting when they're containing a fire. And some of these fires are acres and acres, and they're, they're huge. And what firefighters do to contain, so one thing to understand, containing a fire, so when they say on, uh, if you're reading an article on the news, the fire is 50 or 65% contained. What does that mean? That means that they have contained it. That still means that the fire is um, raging. It doesn't mean that the fire is out, it's just contained. And how firefighters contain that is they dig these trenches and um, they're, so let's say there's a big forest and what they start to do is they build, or not build, they dig, they dig these holes around the fire. And you can just imagine the stress of that job. There's a fire going on and where they're digging, they have to dig quick. They don't have time to dig deep. They have to dig wide. And that's something we have to understand. A lot of the time, the holes that they're building, they're not holes, they're trenches, they're these lines, they're about a foot deep only. So you can imagine, you could put a shovel, you know, a couple times and you'll get about a foot, that's a foot, but they're 10 feet wide. So what they're doing is they're trying to come up with a solution, quickly be able to contain the fire. They don't have time to dig deep, but they can do something that's wide. So they do about a one, Foot by 10 foot, that's usually what it is. And this is around a giant forest. So think about how much work that is in the middle of chaos, right? They're putting a lot of work in, and there's a lot of firefighters out there. That's why when there's a wildfire, they call, they call firefighters from different areas. When we had ours, we had firefighters from all over because it takes a big amount of people to contain a fire like that. So let's say 65% of the fire is contained, 65% of that fire around is surrounded by, and it's, they have it in one spot. They have it steady. It's still burning, but it's there. And let's say they even have the fire 100% contained. The fire is still burning, and there's still a chance that it could come out of the whole, you know, the big, big um, trenches that they dig. There's a chance that it could come out. It's lower because they have it contained. The fire is still burning, and it's easier to manage. But one thing about fires is that even though it's not able to come out this way, they have most of it contained, where else can the fire go? If it can't go this way, where else can the fire go? It could go down or it can go up, right? And that's what happened here. So when we had fires in Oregon, so there were flames that hopped over to Washington. And if you guys know the Columbia River, it's not small, it's not very narrow. There was quite a bit of space, but there was so much happening on this side, even though the firefighters got most of it contained, where, not most of it, they had some of it contained, it was massive. The fire was, they were holding it in one spot, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to contain it. And when they were focused on containing around it, it still went up and it went over to Washington. And where I'm going with this is 
many believers are trying to contain their issues in life. They're trying to contain their um, lack of discipline, whether it's lack of knowing God's word, or they're just passive. Whether they're messing with sin, whether they're allowing different things to happen in their life, they're just building a very narrow trench around their problem that is temporarily. That fire can still be burning, right? That fire can still be going on, and they just have a temporarily, tempor- temporarily, so- help me out. There, yeah, exactly, a solution around it. But we as believers are not to be trying to contain our problems. We need to, isn't it better to not have issues? Isn't it better to be in health, right? And that's who believer, as believers, that's what our life is supposed to be. We're not trying to contain problems. And firefighters, they die in those um, wildfires. Their life is at risk. They get exhausted. They get physically exhausted. Many times the firefighters get trapped inside the fire because where they're seeing the fire, where they're really focused on trying to contain the fire, the fire sneaks up behind them and they get trapped. And believe, with, same with believers. And it can start in your mind. If you are not taking your thoughts captive and you're trying to contain the thoughts that you have, and containing means suppressing, holding it. It's not taking charge of it. It's just holding it together. Those thoughts can contain you if you don't aggressively go at it. So instead of containing things, we need to go aggressively at it and we need to remove the fire, right? We're not trying to build um, a circle around the fire and just hope the fire stays there. No, we got to take it out. And what, how do we take things out? Through, with God's word. It starts with knowing our authority, knowing our ability, that what we have is stronger than anything around us. And that's very important to understand, that we have the ability to do that. And we're going to read that in Isaiah. So Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Verse 2, Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And waters in the Bible tends to symbolize um, storms or kind of outrage, you know, uh, whether it's a storm or something, just chaos. Other, in, some, in other times, it symbolizes something else. But that's an important thing to be aware of is understanding the words in the Bible, what they symbolize, and what um, they're referring to in the context. So, when you pass through the waters, through the storms, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. So even when things come up, even when there is stuff happening around us, we can walk through the fire. Don't try to contain a fire. You're not supposed to contain a fire. You're supposed to go through it. You're supposed to walk through it, and it's not supposed to affect you. Because what we have is God's life in us. What we have penetrates through every single part of our body into every area of our life where we can walk through these things, and we don't have to try to contain the fire. When there's a fire... Don't try to mess with it. Don't try to contain it. Just keep pressing through. Keep going because a fire is a distraction. The enemy wants to cause chaos. He wants to cause storms. He wants to bring us thoughts of negativity. He wants to bring bring us symptoms. But we don't have to deal with that. If you understand we don't have to deal with that, that that's not how God created us, you're not going to worry about trying to contain a fire. You're just going to focus on God's word and walk right through it and be able to stand strong and not let it penetrate and not let it affect you. So it's very important that we stand firm on God's word. We can't get away from God's word because a lot of people uh, listen to different sermons and different teachings, and they're always trying to get something new. But the truth is God's word has never changed, nor will it ever change, nor will there ever be something new out of his word. It's going to remain the same. And what we just have to do is we have to dig deep into his word. We have to let his word root us. We have to let his truth um, keep us going. 
And we're going to read one more place and we're going to wrap it up. So if we go into James. James 1. And we're going to start in verse 13. So James 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Own desires. So we have to understand that a fire doesn't just start out of nowhere. There's always a reason that a fire starts, where there's a whole bunch of brush on the ground, whether some kid was playing with fireworks and a whole forest went on fire, whether um, someone left a cigarette. There's always a reason for a fire. It doesn't just start, right? It's either really hot and um, the ground sparks. So there's always a reason for that. And we have to understand, sin doesn't just happen. Sin doesn't just naturally just happen out of the blue, right? But it's because people are tempted and they're drawn away. They're drawn by their own desires and they're not drawn by God's desires, right? And this is something that we hear in the church and we hear in the world. And it's God has you exactly where you need to be. And that's a lie. The truth is we are where we're at because of the choices that we have made. And we hear that people say this phrase to people that um, are either in sin or when someone's struggling, they're like, you know, God has you where you are because he's just working on you or he's just, you know, he put you there for a reason. And the truth is, the reason why people are who they are is because of choices. You don't just get to jail just because you get to jail. You make choices to get there, right? And God created us to have dominion over this earth. He also gave us the ability to make choices. And these choices, the choices that we make, they will um, determine where we're at. And God helps us. God, God's grace, he is with us, right? He doesn't leave us. But when we are drawn by our own desires and not God's desires, we're going to end up somewhere we don't want to be. We're going to end up in a place where we're trying to fight a wildfire, and we can't fight a wildfire by fighting it, right? We can't do that. We have to be in God's word. We have to be rooted in his word, and we have to stand firm on it. And if you're right now, if you're happy with where you're at in life and you're just continuing to seek God's word and you know having that relationship with him, keep pressing through, keep doing that. But if you're not happy and you also don't know what to do, you're confused or you're like, hey, I'm in, you know, I have this problem and I don't know how to get past it. That's what we're here for. As a body, we're here to help each other. You're not supposed to be in a fire. You're supposed to be walking with God and we're here to help each other. That's what the body is here for. And we are here to um, encourage you and to help you. And later during the sermon, we'll, our service, we'll have an opportunity for prayer. And we encourage you. If you guys need help in the area, you guys need encouragement, or you're walking through something that you're just not sure how to deal with, you don't know how to do, that's what we're here for. Because the body is there to help each other, to strengthen each other. And just concluding at that, that God is for you that he's not against you, that he is for you. And we hear that a lot. And the reason that we are where we are is because some of the decisions that we have made and a lot of the times the lies we have believed of the enemy, right? The enemy will bring sickness upon us. It's not your fault you have sickness. The enemy is the one who brings sickness. Fear, all those things are of the enemy. And we're here to help you. We're here to get you out of that. And that's good news that God's word has the power to do that. It's not someone being, you know, being good, being anointed. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one who has all ability to do that because he paid the price. And we're just here being his vessels and we're here to help each other and strengthen each other. 